Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled Psychoanalytic Self-Awareness Quotes. This is TQ 975 to 982. Therapy quote number 975. The writing has been an exercise trying to work my way towards clarity. Get out the pen and face the beast yourself and what's bothering you. No, well, that's not exactly it. No, okay, let's go a little deeper. It's very hard peeling the layers off your own onion. <laughs> <laughs> this comes from a documentary about Joni Mitchell, the famous uh, folk singer from the 60s. So she, she said in that documentary that uh, she read psychology books and she wanted to understand how to uh, peel the layers of the onion um, by that. Uh, generally, the meaning is uh, confronting our own rationalizations. Okay, so rationalizations are used to deceive the self. Right? And sometimes you face, you confront a rationalization, then you find another rationalization underneath it. And then you want to go down again to find the original uh, unconscious conflict, emotional conflict, right? Um, okay, uh, the next one's about acting out. Okay, acting out. Acting out can be looked at from at least four points of view. One, acting out can be a means of avoiding anxiety. That is, the person acts out when he gets too close to an uncomfortable or unbearable feeling. Instead of perceiving the emotion and examining it, he gives way to it. By giving way to the emotion, the anxiety and the pain that would be attached to facing the original traumatic event is successfully avoided. Number two, acting out can be a manifestation of the neurosis. That is, the repetitive compulsive act is an acting out. In this sense, acting out is present all the time and stays with the client as a continued activity. Three, acting out can be the appearance of feelings and behavior which previously had been repressed. The defense becomes thinner and thinner, permitting the emotion more and more freedom until there is an open display of it. Four, acting out can be a testing out. Often clients report a kind of activity which appears to be a tentative attempt to establish a sound working relationship in the world of today. These attempts are actings out insofar as the client doesn't examine his motive it's very difficult to make a determination that the client's actions are either hindrances to or means of progress. So either we repeat and don't remember, that's acting out, or we talk and reflect and uh, remember. So Joni Mitchell says, her writing is an attempt to remember. So this uh, quote expands on the idea of acting out. So generally, it's a defense against anxiety. Okay, so if we feel uncomfortable, we do something, run to the fridge and uh, and eat some cookies. So then we don't we don't need to feel uh, the anxiety of feeling unloved or feeling unconsciously being reminded of being abandoned or alone or something like that. So we, we eat uh, the cookies, right? Um, the sweets. See, the sweets are a metaphor for mother's sweetness. Woodman says, um, you know, if the child is crazy about sweets, he's trying to say that he's looking, that he's lacking sweetness in his life. Um, so that's the, the general understanding of acting out to avoid a feeling, right? Uh, the second one is uh, the repetition compulsion, when there's a developmental trauma. Okay, so there's a, that's an open wound. So the person repeats the childhood scene, repeats the childhood situation in the present, transfers the childhood past into the present, um, reliving it, reviving it, reenacting it, replaying it in order to 
somehow master it or understand it or come to terms with it or to overcome it somehow. And But this is Sisyphus. After the age of five, this acting out um, is endless, like Sisyphus. So he says here that uh, acting out in this case is uh, present all the time and stays with the person as continued activity. So he's acting out all the time. He's not expressing his real self. His energy is not directed toward the real self, expressing his unique individuality, his unique wishes. He's not being creative from his real self. His energy is devoted to repeating the childhood scene. That's called acting out. The third one is, uh, third version of it is, um, the person's uh, rationalizations become thinner and thinner. Uh, his excuse or his defense mechanisms become wear out over time with age. So the emotions that he was denying his whole life maybe start to come up. That's a form of, uh, similar to the first one. Uh, so number th the first example and the third example seem uh, very similar. But in the, in the third case, it has that quality of something he's been denying all of his life. Maybe he has complicated grief. He could mourn losses. And the way to not mourn the loss was to be manic. So he was acting out all the time. Uh, and then one day his uh, acting out defenses wore thin. And then he started to cry. Or then he started to, uh, uh, oh no, no, then he, he didn't want to cry. He didn't want to mourn. Um, so then, um, I guess he would do something else then to deal with the anxiety of not being able to mourn the loss. Anyways, this third one has sort of like this delayed onset of acting out. So acting out is sort of active continuously. The person feels bad, they eat cookies. Uh, what if the person feel bad, feels bad and doesn't eat cookies? 30 years later, he starts eating cookies. So maybe there's that delayed aspect of it. The fourth one, we haven't seen this one before. Um, acting out can be a testing out. So he's, he's saying here, the person's acting out, but maybe the person is trying to experiment with being functional in the world. He doesn't know why he's doing it, but unconsciously he's testing to see uh, if it would be safe for him to be functional. So he's doing something with that kind of intention. So they're a little confused there about it. So we're not sure, is he... Is he uh, experimenting to see if it's okay to be functional and healthy. Is he acting out that way? Um, we're not really sure, right? So that, that's why he says maybe it's, it's for that reason, to act out as, as a testing out. Not just to deny the feeling, but to test out, would it be okay to feel? So he's sort of in that middle ground there. Um, okay, then another, the next defense mechanism, uh, reaction formation. Reaction formation. The method by which he defends himself is to express the very opposite of that which he wishes. Okay, for example, he wishes for love, but he can't face his own feelings about his needs for love. So he sees a flaw in the person and, there, and therefore is no longer interested. So the, this is the most, probably the most common context of reaction formation. In the sitcom, you can see that the girl liked the guy, uh, but she didn't want to admit it. Uh, she didn't even know it herself, but the viewer saw that she liked the guy, but she herself didn't know it. So she just kept saying how much she hated the guy. That's reaction formation or counterphobia. But she's staying in, the idea is that you stay in touch with the unconscious wish that you're afraid of. So to stay in unconscious contact with the wish, you express the opposite. Uh, and that, that sort of has a direct link, uh, a direct uh, link to the unconscious wish, sometimes called counterphobia. Right? So we've had a number of examples on reaction formation. Um, sometimes it's used in connection with vices. You know, um, a person doesn't want to engage in, in a in a certain uh, unhealthy activity. So he overtly, uh, passionately says how bad it is, but unconsciously he likes it, but he's afraid to admit it, that kind of thing. 
So he's staying in touch with his unconscious wish by talking about it in its reverse form, that kind of thing. Um, this next one sort of summarizes, it was one author's version of summarizing the idea of, uh, of being dysfunctional or how it comes about. The individual has a need which must be met. So the baby has a need for love. Okay, the, His need is thwarted. He doesn't get it. This creates conflict. The baby reacts by building great fantasies and uh, his unbearable feelings around, and he has unbearable feelings around his unmet need. The conflict runs on because the need continues. That's the open wound, huh? The baby needs, still needs love, right? But by now, the need can be complicated by the very danger of obtaining it. Okay, that's, that's the key there, right? But by now, the need for love can be complicated by the very danger of obtaining the love. The resulting tension is so great that it blinds the person to reality. It negates what is there and creates what is not there. We tie ourselves, for example, we tie ourselves to people who are not satisfying for us in the hope that they will change. This is the essence of neurosis. The human being's inability to respond emotionally when he actually has that which he professes to want. His flight when he finds love, say. Okay. <laughs> That's not a bad quote, actually. Um, see, it's related to all of these defense mechanisms used over time ad nauseum to in the repetition compulsion of trying to master the trauma of not getting the love that the baby needed, that the person needed when they were a baby. So that's all they know is these defense mechanisms. It becomes so much a part of him. So let's say finally he does get the love. All, he, all he's, he's just so familiar with the defense mechanisms, it becomes very complicated. It becomes very conflicted about that. So then he gets the love and he, he runs away from it because he spent so much time. It's like that use it or lose it thing. Like you, you, you address your need for love. Um, you, you love or you lose your ability to appreciate love. Like something like that. Um, it kind of reminds me of that. Uh, what is it? The, the flea in the jar. The flea was jumping. But the flea uh, bumped up against the lid in the jar. This went on for a while. Finally, the, the experimenter uh, took off the lid and the flea wouldn't jump out because he was so used to the defense mechanism and, and the pain um, around trying to get his need met in the past. So sort of a fear conditioning that way. But this adds the element of the inner conflicts, right? So... Uh, it's complicated by the danger of obtaining love because he used all of these defense mechanisms. So I'll just uh, leave that there. Okay, uh, the next one is from uh, Von Franz. Quote, Well, you have a creative problem. You should do some writing or painting. Give the unconscious credit. It's like taking a completely new medicine and watching the result. If someone tells me of a big problem, I say, okay, that's the conscious problem. Now let's see what's underneath. Okay. Um, so th th this quote just sort of emphasizes the idea that, uh, as mentioned yesterday, it's if you just focus on the symptom and don't address the underlying conflict uh, that created the symptom, the symptom will come back in some other form. So Burglar says, your unconscious conflicts will faithfully follow you into your next marriage. So you don't need the divorce. Changing your mate doesn't change the inner psychic structure. If you heal the inner psychic structure, you can save the marriage, right? So just. So he says, give the unconscious some credit. 
like Joni Mitchell says, do some writing, keep a journal, and uh, you know, mirror yourself. See, the act of writing, you're, it's like free association. Things come up, then you can make connections. Yeah, that was uh, in that documentary, she said that she would alternate. She would write, and then she would paint, and then she would repeat the cycle, write, and then paint. She would go through these phases back and forth. I think she said she would uh, paint her joy and then write her sadness or something. And then she would alternate back and forth. Interesting. Huh? Yeah. Um, yeah, all of those... Album covers, yeah, she painted those album covers herself, yeah. Okay, uh, okay, the next one here, one from Fenichel. Okay, what is said and what is meant may represent different parts of one and the same whole. So long as the analyst doesn't know the whole, he cannot surmise what is meant. Neurotic symptoms especially often become understandable only through their historical connections. He was just uh, emphasizing the idea of the understanding the person as a whole. And, um, so the person says one thing, he means another thing, but they're both parts of the same general theme. Yeah. Okay, uh, this next one, I thought I would follow up on yesterday's video about Masterson's model here. Okay, the images, the, the images of the two mothers, the, the one rewarding and the other withdrawing, are powerfully interjected by the child to form a split object relations unit which which consists of two separate part units okay each of which comprises a self a part self representation and a part object representation with an affective component linking the two together Both remain separated from each other through the mechanism of the splitting defense. Object relations, object relations theory is the, the study or the consideration or the perspective or the idea of the internalization of interpersonal relations. Okay, um, so the baby comes out of the womb Sometimes the mother's satisfying, sometimes the mother's frustrating. The baby can't handle it when the baby's the baby can't handle it when the mother's frustrating, so the baby denies it and thinks that this frustrating person or other is not the mother. That's called a splitting defense. So uh, what generally happens is uh, so here's the graph here. Okay, so um the baby creates okay, a part object representation, an understanding of the mother or imp and some impression of the mother as being loving, satisfying, caring, giving, beautiful, okay, because so sometimes the mother is satisfying, sometimes the mother uh, does meet the child's needs, okay, so sometimes she's like that. Now when the mother is a uh, Oh, hold on a sec. We got uh, one of the birds here. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, there he goes. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, back back to the back to the graph here. Now, sometimes the mother is distracted, unavailable. She's talking on the phone. Now, the, from the baby's point of view, the mother's withdrawing her love. So now there's a part object representation, an impression of the mother as being abandoning, as being refusing, as being unsatisfying, rejecting. Uh, this is terrifying for the child. So that so this child, the part self representation, he feels terrified here. Okay, so when the mother's not there, now this this understanding of the mother is split. See the line here? That's the splitting defense mechanism. Now this, okay, this is denied. He doesn't believe it. It's impossible. Mother cannot be this terrifying uh, person. Because the baby has to bond to the mother. So the baby can only conceive of the mother in the positive way. Right? And if this happens, he denies it. He's, it's, split, it's split. So this is called uh, uh, an object relations unit. An understanding of the mother as being frightening, linked to... Okay, the, the, emo, the link here is the emotions. So how does the child... This is. A, representation of the part self he, now he feels terrified terrifying mother terrified child now this scenario uh, the child uh, denies okay the child needs this the mother's loving and the child is loved so the linking affect is comfortable and happy and soothe and the mother's wonderful and comforting and soothing now because of the small size of the baby in his unconscious fantasy the theory is this is like a goddess and this is like a demon okay now here's the the loved self and here's the devalued self but this is all too painful so this is denied that's the splitting representation so this takes place sort of between 18 months and 36 months on the way to whole object relations, right? But um, now what can happen is, so between 18 and 30, so prior to this stage, there's the fusion, that's the narcissistic pattern, that's prior to that, right? And then after this is the whole object relations, two whole objects, whole object and whole self are relating to each other, mutuality there. But in between the narcissistic pattern and the healthy object, mutual object relations pattern, there's this uh, sort of in-between stage called uh, the codependent pattern. Now in the jargon of Masterson's uh, model here, he calls this the borderline disorder of the self. This, But that term is only very specific for his model. Okay, no one else uses that. So just in general terms, this is the codependent pattern. So they're very emotional here. Why, why is there a lot of emotionality with the codependent pattern? Because the codependent pattern may project any one of these four onto another person. So let's say there's the therapist there. Right? So for example, if the client, if the person re projects or sees or fantasizes or wish or coaxes or imagines that the other person okay, is this, okay, so the arrow, okay, so this arrow goes to the therapist. So now the person experiences the other person as a wonderful, amazing, all oh, one, all oh, great, this idealized, all oh, this there is so good, so, so uh, wonderful, so intelligent, so uh, helpful, so understanding, so endless compliments here, right? Um, so that's uh, that means the, the understanding of the mother is being satisfying, gets transferred onto the person here, whoever this is, and they think this is now when that person does that. That preserves this relational unit. Now the person feels safe and comforted and soothed, right? Now, imagine this arrow from here, or from here, or from here. Things change. Things can flip around, okay? So, for example, also, okay, in, so in this case, in this first scenario here, okay, a uh, therapist steps in and resonates with the object representation of Row ru This is called row ru rewarding object relations unit. The mother's rewarding 
when the child uh, needs when the child is when the child needs the mother the mother is rewarding satisfying loving okay um, this by the way is called the wo ru the withdrawing object relations unit okay so in this case the therapist steps in and resonates with the object representation of the ro ru unit and thus feels good and powerful in, and in control now, if the therapist accepts this projection, if the therapist uh, denies the reality that, she, that he's just a, a worker, a social worker, you know, a helper, a helper kind of person, if he accepts this person saying he's like a, the most, uh, the greatest uh, therapist in the world, if he accepts this kind of projection, he, he, then he feels good himself. And he accepts that. He colludes. Now, if he colludes and he accepts that, he, the person feels good. So they replayed this original scenario. Baby needs love, mother's loving, and he recreated that. So he's recreating the childhood scene, and he's splitting this off. So that means when he's doing this, he's preserving the splits. He's denying this. So he's just holding on to this. So this is the case where the person goes to the therapist and says, uh, I want to feel better. I don't want to get better. I just want to feel better. So just to feel better, he does this. And the therapist says, okay, you want to see me as so great? Fine, and I'll talk to you. And he feels good. So the question often is, do you want to feel better or get better? This represents just feeling better. Right? So here, the client here. Okay, the client projects um, the part object of the row root and acts out uh, the part self representation. Okay, he sees himself as dependent, passive, and helpless. So he's like the little child there, and here's the good parent. Okay, again, so he's re replaying the loved child and the loving parent, right? So amazing therapist and a satisfied client re re replays the original uh, scene here. What's the result of this? After time, everyone feels good and treatment stops. There's no progress there. There's no healing that takes place. He just feels good for a little while, right? Now, interestingly enough, this, let's say there isn't a therapist here. Well, you can project that onto food. You can project that onto your, uh, I don't know, your, your, your fantasy of a movie star or something or your, your sports hero or something. Or if, if you're a fan of Joni Mitchell, you might say she's so amazing and you listen to her music and you feel soothed or something. Right. <laughs> so um, the example here is that this is a therapist, but this could be any anything that's overly valued, right? And then you feel good in relation to it. Okay, now let's uh, now let's project the negatives. Now let's say that doesn't take place. Let's say the therapist disagrees. Let's say the therapist says, "No, I'm not going to step. I'm not going to play your good mommy." You're not going to play my good mommy. Boom. You're the bad mommy. Now, the client projects his memories of his mother being rejecting. Okay. Transference-like uh, structure here. Now he's going to project this demon image. So in the unconscious, this is a little demon here, right? Frightening creature. He's going to project that demon onto the therapist. Now the person... Now the person has the attitude towards the therapist that the baby had towards his demon uh, fantasy mother mother and uh, when the mother was refusing so when the mother was when the giantess in the nursery didn't offer her love the baby sees her as a demon okay that's in the unconscious so the codependent pattern flips he's either love you're either loving or you're terrifying you're uh, idealization or devaluation right so now if this takes place, now, now, now of course, uh, he's going to say, you're so terrible, you're, uh, what do you say here? You're, you're withholding, you're rejecting, you're cold, you're critical, you're uncaring, okay, uh, you're uncaring, you're cold, you're so mean. That's, the ba that's what the baby wanted to say to the mother. Hey, mother, you're not loving me, you're cold, you're critical, you're uncaring, you're withholding, you're rejecting. Jesus, my way. so that's, now he's expressing his anger towards his mother. Okay, so, so in this case, the client projected the, the, the unsatisfying mother onto the 
therapist. Now he's going to be pseudo-aggressive. He's going to be angry at the therapist and blame the therapist. But that's a repetition compulsion gone awry. He's just replaying, okay, this side here. Okay, you know, if he's not conscious of it, he's still preserving the split. You see the split there? The goal of therapy is to heal the splits. The goal of therapy is to bring these two together to form a whole circle here, and to bring these two together to form a whole circle here. And this splitting line has disappeared, and you, ha and you have whole object relations. So the end result would be a whole object okay, uh, connecting to a whole self, and there's a mutuality there. Right. Okay. So, um, so what happens when this takes place? Everyone feels bad. Treatment stops. Okay. So if 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 the client thinks the therapist is is a little demon, uh, ther so therapist it does it doesn't work, right? And if he agrees with that and he doesn't know how to handle it and it's stuck there, the treatment fails, right? Okay, now what about the self-representations? Okay, now sometimes the person projects his image of himself onto the therapist. So let's say in this scenario, in the rewarding object relations unit, there is the loving mother, the loved self. Let's say the person projects the loved self onto the therapist and he identifies with the loving parent. Now, this person, the client, is playing the role of loving parent by thinking that the therapist is a helpless little child. So in this transference situation, the person thinks, Oh, therapist, you're, you're, you're a wounded uh, uh, child yourself. Well, I'm going to be the good loving mother and I'm going to take care of you. Okay, so here, the roles are reversed. The distortion is complete and treatment stops. Okay, it is an instant replay of the developmental arrest but the players have ch changed parts. So this is the arrested development there, right? And he's just replaying this stuck situation where the mother can only be good and he cannot, he cannot face the ambivalence with the mother. He cannot face that the mother is sometimes mostly loving and sometimes frustrating. If the splitting defense mechanism is there, that means this was created because the mother was more frustrating than loving. That's why this is here, because the mother is more loving than frustrating. If the mother is more loving than frustrating, then by the age of three, they come together to form whole object relations. But in arrested development, that means the mother is more frustrating than loving, and the splitting defense mechanism is still, used, is still being used. Now, when the splitting defense mechanism is still being used, the person doesn't reach whole object relations. The whole object relations is one step closer to the psychological birth and, and the capacities of the real self. They don't get that. One of the capacities of the real self is that it can mourn losses. Here, the person can't mourn losses because either everyone's a goddess or a demon. Right? You can't mourn a goddess or a demon in your unconscious fantasy. You can only mourn a real person. But to get to the point where the other is a real person, you have to bring these split images of the other together to form a whole and, and that, at the same time when that happens the split images of the self come together to form a whole but there, but this is stuck here this is arrested development this is arrested development here so healing is facing the unconscious ambivalence with the mother accepting both sides if you can accept both sides if the person can accept that when they were a baby that the mother was more frustrating than loving, okay, we're forgiving the mother, now the splits come together. All right. Okay, the fourth scenario here is that uh, sometimes the person uh, projects the devalued self onto the therapist. He identifies with the aggressor. Okay, so here's the, the rejecting mother, the rejecting side of the mother here. But he projects his rejected self okay, onto the therapist. Now, the person sees the therapist as a devalued, no good child. And he's the critical parent. And now he's going to put down the therapist. You no good therapist, you, you're, you're terrible and this and that. Right? And he, he's replaying, he's replaying the rest of development. He's not acknowledging the splits. He's just replaying this side. See, now the codependent can flip back and forth all, all the time. It's chaotic there because he could project this, he, and the next minute he can project this one, and, or this one, and then this one, you see, and, uh, and so on.
So again, uh, healing takes place when we uh, forgive our parents. When we forgive our parents, these two halves come together to form a whole. The splitting line disappears. The self represent the part self representations as being uh, the loved self and the rejected self. They come together and they form a whole, and this this disappears, kind of thing. So that's why the codependent pattern is considered more erratic, more emotional, um, because they're projecting so much. Now with the narcissistic pattern, things are more simple. Uh, things are more extreme. Things are more intense. Um, so uh, they, they've completely identified with the aggressor. Um, um, and uh, they either see the other as some omnipotent uh, god, like a god, and they feel this like a little god, so big god, little god relationship, kind of in their unconscious fantasy. So the baby was a little god, and the mother was a bigger god. So they're repeating that. If that's not there, then it's there's a huge devaluation, and there's there's the the, the devil creature and the devalued. So it's more extreme with the narcissistic pattern. That's why they're because the main emotions are angry, greed, spite, envy. The codependent pattern, they sometimes love, they care, then they flip around, then they're angry, then they're disappointing, then they caretaking, then they feel devalued. They don't know who they are because they're flipping around so much, right? So that's the thing about that. Okay, so just added a little bit to yesterday's video about um, object relations theory. Um, the baby temporarily does this in the first three years, but by the age of three with enough love, the split images come together to form a whole image of the other as a realistic whole person. Okay, um, now this takes place when the mother respects the child as a person in their own right. If the mother is using the child, exploiting the child, okay, the child has to deny that. That's the splitting defense mechanism. Right, and so on. That novel about the Jekyll and Hyde sort of tried to talk about that. They were the same person. So the mother was Jekyll and the mother was Hyde. That was an attempt to tap into that fairy tale motif. So fairy tales and myths talk about the splitting defense mechanism pretty much in almost every story, really. In every myth, there's a good God, a helpful God, and there's a terrifying demon creature. That's the splitting defense mechanism. That's the emotionality of the baby. Myths and fairy tales describe the emotional, emotionality of the baby, the inner world. Myths and fairy tales are true on the inside, not on the outside. Okay, uh, well, so just add one to splitting here. Some clients see things in extremes, in black, in uh, black or white terms. This is reflective of the defense mechanism referred to as splitting. It can also refer to emotions. Splitting causes them to have self and other conceptions that are unintegrated. Okay, splitting causes them to have self and other representations that are unintegrated. That's what the splitting means. They're not integrated, right? So these these split images are not integrated. They're separate. They're unintegrated. You want them to be integrated. You want them to be synthesized. You want them to come together to form a whole representation. The splitting prevents that, you see. Without... You need the whole representation. You need, the, you need a representation of the self as whole and a representation of the other as whole. You need the two circles here, like... Like two dimes, you need two quarters, you know, you need two whole circles, you know. And uh, and that leads to the that leads to the ability to form mutual relationships, to love another, to mourn the loss. Um, splitting the splitting defense deals with the anxiety of the mother being more frustrating than loving, and they're stuck there. So they can they can't mourn losses because it's it's they, they, they can't even accept that the mother was frustrating. So how do you mourn the loss of the mother? You're overly attached to her. You can't mourn someone if you're way too fused with that person. Because it feels like you're losing yourself if you're fused with them. Right? That's called complicated grief, aggravated grief, prolonged grief. Right? That can lead to pathological melancholia, nostalgia, 
the pathological nostalgia or melancholia, uh, burnout, soul, soul loss, possible nervous breakdown, stress on stress, symptoms of PTSD can come from there. And it can lead to, as one person said, to becoming a curmudgeon late in life, not an elder. See, the curmudgeon is bitter, miserly, stingy, greedy, irritable. He's still battling with the mother. He never faced the ambivalence of the mother. He never faced the ambivalence of the mother. On Mother's Day, he just said, oh, mother, you're so wonderful. He never said on Mother's Day, hey, you know, my, I've been worshipping you, but that's not realistic. Tell me the truth. Tell me about my childhood. I want to get to know you as a person. So we had that quote before about uh, from a dear child. She said, um, the more I got to know my parents as regular people, uh, the more I loved them, the more I could love them. Or the more, the more I understood them, the more I could love them. I forgot exactly what it was. Rosanna, dear child. Um, so, uh, so the suggestion in this from this series is that on Mother's Day, that's the day when mothers write letters to their adult children. That's Mother's Day. That's the day when mothers do the work. They write letters of confession and apology, or or, or at least describe the truth. What happened at the birth? Was there prenatal distress? Was the baby kicking a lot? How was the talk about the birth trauma? Was the cord wrapped around? Was the, were there procedures that took place? How long was the separation from the birth, uh, from the actual birth moment to when the baby was handed to the mother? How long was that gap? How did the mother feel? Did she feel? Did she accept the child? Did she unconsciously? Was she? in a bad mood when the child was returned to her and then she couldn't really bond with the child. To confess all of the details, what was the feeding like? How long did the breastfeeding last? Was there best breastfeeding or was it bottled? See, if it's bottled, that's the alexthymic breast, the cold, unfeeling breast. Right? That's the rejecting mother. And uh, now some authors say, no, it's still possible for the child to have a loving experience with the mother if in every other way, she's motherly and caring. Um, but if not, then um, ideally the, the mother breastfeeds naturally. That's called the psychosomatic breast. So that, that facilitates the bond, that facilitates the mother being able to be in touch herself with her own maternal instincts, to be attuned to the baby's needs. So that works towards the secure attachment style. Remember, a secure attachment style means the child can achieve the psychological birth, whole object relations, and he can know himself, then he can mourn losses. A, a secure attachment style is needed for the person to be able to mourn losses. If the person's using, if the person's still using the splitting defense mechanism after the age of three, okay, they, that's an insecure attachment style. They can't mourn losses. They're still using the splitting defense. The splitting defense means they're projecting all the time. Prejudice comes from there. You're projecting, right? So maybe we could say that, uh, that maybe we can refer to this on here. Um, so because, uh, because uh, it's painful to always be re reminded that the mother was so frustrating, sometimes the person projects the, the part image of the mother as being frustrating and refusing and frightening and terrible and horrifying and all that, on to non-threatening substitute others. The therapist is a non-threatening substitute other. He's, he's, he's helpful. He wants to be helpful. So he projects that onto them. Now he thinks the therapist is so terrible. So that's so this, this is the psychic maneuver of prejudice. Now in the outer world, they can project this onto others, onto any non-threatening substitute other. Yeah. So the person is not addressing the splitting defense mechanism. He's not healing the splits when he's doing that. He just wants to feel better in the moment. He's not getting better. Right? So projection is a defense mechanism to just make yourself feel temporarily better, but you're not healing. So the therapist, every self-help book asks that question. Do you want to feel better or get better? So to get better, you have to face the unconscious ambivalence of the mother. Stop projecting. Okay. Face your rationalizations. Peel the onion, Joni Mitchell says. Yeah, Jody Mitchell's a role model in that way. Um, she was very tolerant and interested in 
understanding people and uh, um, she said in that documentary she said she didn't want to be a human jukebox she didn't want to be objectified she wanted to be treated as a person and she wanted to explore herself and those kinds of things okay the next one here um, the main okay here we are the main task is to prevent the client from regressing to the parent seeking level that's the rewarding object relations unit the row rule okay this is a cardinal feature of dysfunction okay so uh, in that case the client can be ingratiating or impatient impatient child or it can be you know, tantalizing or overly uh, appealing trying to seduce the therapist to like him or something. Now, if the therapist doesn't step into the rewarding object relations unit, okay, if he confronts that, then now the person feels, de he flips. Now he projects the rejecting mother. So in this first part, he, he projected the satisfying mother. If the therapist doesn't accept that, doesn't include, suddenly he thinks, oh, then you're the rejecting mother. You're either a good mother or a bad mother. And things are split that way. The person doesn't see the therapist as a regular person. It's either you're wonderful or terrible. Okay. Upon feeling rejected by the therapist, now he's going to either uh, be resentful, he might be apologetic like a child, and oh, he'll punish himself, or he'll be resentful, or he'll be, manip or he'll be vindictive t towards the therapist. You see? So this, this kind of conveys the emotionality of the splitting defense mechanism, right? In the narcissistic pattern, it's more extreme. It's either you're idealized or devalued. Uh, in the codependent pattern, it's uh, you're loving or you're cold and rejecting. It's toned down a little bit. That seems to be one of the main differences there. Okay, these uh, I think all of these models, if we understand all of these models, it can help lead to um, empathy. Empathy, okay, one version of it is means to quote stand in another's shoes not only walk in their moccasins what about to stand in their shoes yeah, I like that one to stand in their shoes you can walk in their shoes what about stand in their shoes just stand in their shoes for a while to experience what someone else is experiencing without being judgmental or critical so we started with uh, a reference to Joni Mitchell, so I thought I would just quickly end on a Joni Mitchell uh, reference here. She has a <laughs> she has a comedy song. Joni Mitchell has a comedy song. Uh, I guess it's her only one, I suppose. I don't know. She has a comedy song about the therapy process because she went to a therapist, it seems, and she said in the documentary openly that she was reading and studying psychology. I assume she went to a therapist. So she went to... <laughs> now either uh, the therapist... Well, so one scenario is the therapist did have a narcissistic pattern. So she wrote a parody song about her therapist. In the parody song, the song is called Twisted. Um, so you want to hear a funny song, listen to a song called Twisted by Joni, Mis by, uh, Joni Mitchell. It's off her uh, Court and Spark album. Um, anyways, uh, um, so so one scenario is uh, so in the song uh, she she says that uh, so she went to the therapist for help. The therapist says, "Yes, yeah, you you need treatment. We we can help you." What? You think I'm crazy? I'm not crazy. You're the crazy one. <laughs> so maybe it's resistance uh, maybe she just wanted to feel better not get better I don't know this was early in her she was only she was uh, only 20 something I guess um, or maybe it's genuine maybe the therapist did have a narcissistic pattern and her criticism of him was legitimate so we don't really know so a, and uh, a part of the song is that in the song uh, there's a background voice mocking Mitchell, uh, the character, doesn't have to be personal, the character in the song is describing 
how the therapist thinks that the, that the person in this, that the character is twi crazy. Now there's this background voice mocking the therapist. Man, okay. <laughs> Man, the chick is twisted crazy. Boop shooty, you hear? Flip city. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, the, 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 the conclusion to the song was, my analyst told me that I was right, right out of my head, but I said, dear doctor, I think that it's you instead, because I've got a thing that's unique and new, and I'll prove it. I'll have the last laugh on you, because instead of one head, I got two, and you know, two heads are better than one. <laughs> So either she was being very defensive and using humor to deal with the anxiety of the therapist saying, um, well, you, you're of two minds. So that would be the codependent pattern. That flipping back and forth means still using the splitting defense mechanism. We can say that's two minds, two object relational units, the row roo unit, the rewarding object relations unit, meaning image of the other as loving, connected to an image of the self that's loved. Okay, split off, that's accepted. Now what's denied is the split other relational unit called woru, the withdrawing object relations unit, a representation of the other as being frustrating or unsatisfying, linked to a part self-representation that feels devalued and rejected. And the emotionality there is uh, Masterson calls abandonment depression. And he lists uh, a few feelings in there, hope, helplessness, uh, emptiness, void, uh, sadness, uh, anxiety, anger, uh, sad, and so on, right? Um, so a person doesn't want to face all that, that side, that mind, let's say. Okay. So you see, you got two minds. So maybe the therapist said, you know, you got two minds here. You're using the splitting defense magnet. Well, uh, what's wrong with that? Uh, I can write songs and things. And, uh, you know, two heads are better than one, therapist. Ha ha, you know, he's laughing, mocking the therapist. So maybe she was being defensive. Uh, she was showing resistance and using humor and her quick wit to disparage the therapist um, because he, he, he failed the test. If that's the case, he failed the test. He didn't offer a proper interpretation uh, to connect, to offer the connect. Masterson says, if you offer a good interpretation, that'll build a therapeutic alliance. He'll trust because every client, he says, uh, has two questions in mind. Is he safe and does he know what he's doing? Is he safe and does he know what he's doing? Okay. Now, if the therapist offers an interpretation or a confront, a question that helps peel the layer of the onion a little bit, then the person might think, oh, this guy knows what he's doing and he's safe. Oh, I can trust him. So then the therapy would proceed. But if the therapist fails in the testing part in the initial stage, then devalued. Your therapist, you're no good. You're out of your mind. You say I'm no good. You're the one who's nuts. I'm not nuts, right? And I'll prove it to you. You know why? Because two heads are better than... <laughs> That's a funny song, huh? Okay, speaking of songs, I'll just end on the theme song to this series. So the theme song to this series is Windmills of the Mind. Each, vid each video, each therapy quote is, is a kind of windmill of the mind, a reflection of the inner world. So this is uh, Wind Windmills of the Mind, sung by Katja Epstein. It's in German. Nachts, wenn die Straßen plötzlich still sind, wenn die Stadt auf einmal schweigt, wenn aus steinernen Kaminen stumm der Mond zum Steigt, wenn es hier in meinem Zimmer leer und einsam wird um mich, suche ich in den dunklen Schatten die Erinnerung an dich und ich fühle, wie ein Augenblick zur Ewigkeit gerinnt, wenn das Spinnrad meiner Träume längst zerrissene Fäden spinnt und sich leis zu drehen beginnt. Okay.
Okay, so th thank you very much. This has been TQ7, sorry, 975 to 982. So we added a little bit more about uh, acting out. Either we repeat and don't remember and act out and don't remember and don't think about it and just act out and impulsive behavior or emotional eating and we don't ask ourselves why. We don't give the unconscious credit. We don't, right? Um, give... Juan Francis, give the unconscious some credit. Do some writing, do some artwork, like Joni Mitchell. Do, do some of that, and you'll learn about yourself. You'll discover some of your own windmills of the mind. Grief is healed when it's witnessed by a caring other. We are tasked to be our own caring other. Right? That's the moral revolution, to know thyself, to heal thyself, right? to heal the inner child, to accept the inner child. Uh, and as we do that, uh, that brings up the unconscious ambivalence with the parents. Now we have to forgive the parents. So that's, that's in a nutshell, that's what it's all about. Forgive the parents and you'll be healed. But you have to get to know the parents. The parents can help on Mother's Day and Father's Day if they write letters to their adult children confessing and coming clean. That can help. And on Mother's Day and Father's Day, we can actively say, Hey, look, Mother, Father, I want to forgive you. What? What are you talking about? I did nothing wrong. No, I want to forgive you. You're in denial. Tell me the truth. What are you talking about? Well, Robert Bly says maybe you have to push a little bit. Get, get the truth out. Now, if you really can't, they're in deep denial. That, now, that's clarity. They're in deep denial. Um, so... Then you think about, then you read the Enneagram. Which type are they? Okay. Then you get to the idea that maybe they were psychologically incomplete, that they were not mothered and fathered. So therefore they couldn't be a proper mother or father because they were not mothered and fathered themselves. You know? So the parents may have had prenatal distress syndrome. The parents may have had birth trauma. The parents may have had intergenerational trauma meaning they didn't get a secure attachment style themselves. Okay, that's, um, that's a developmental trauma. Trauma with siblings and the environment, with family members, trauma uh, while getting their tonsils out, trauma uh, at the dentist's office. There could have been school shock, some kind of forced relocation situation. So the parents may be caught in their existential dilemma. Now think about the parents. Think about their parents. They had a hard, they had a harder life, didn't they? So there's intergenerational trauma. Intergenerational trauma means no one's offering the child a secure attachment. So we heal this intergenerational trauma when someone gives the unconscious credit. Do some writing, do some art, or do some self-reflection. Read psychology. Joni Mitchell says, read psychology. She said she read psychology. Robert Bly says, read psychology every day for 10 minutes. You may start off reading some of the fluffy stuff, okay, and then you can work towards uh, the analytic approach. Um, I think uh, Pinkola Estes, she said that. She said in the beginning she would just read fluffy self help books. And it was comforting, she said. Uh, but that wasn't enough. But that was a bridge for her. That was a stepping stone for her. Then she looked at the analytic approach, the depth approach after that. Um, so, um, yeah, so acting out. Uh, so either we repeat the original trauma again and again and trying to master it. And, um, uh, or, or we talk and remember and, and heal the splits and differentiate. We get the key out from under mother's pillow, that means differentiation. We heal the splits as whole object relations. Then we reach, then we reach, that's the psychological birth. And with the psychological birth, we reach the real self. So again, the real self has various capacities. Maybe I'll bring it up here. So what are the capacities of the real self? So let's just say either you got a secure attachment style and you got and you that led to you having access to the real self 
or you heal from arrested development and then you got uh, access to the real self in later life what what is the real self the real self has various capacities okay masterson uh, uh, for convenience lists 10 capacities of the real self okay again just briefly the real self allows the person is characterized by spontaneity aliveness of affect the capacity to experience affect deeply with aliveness, with liveliness, joy, vigor, excitement, and spontaneity. Okay? Masterson explains, you know, the real self will allow the person whatever emotions the person needs for the situation as appropriate. If the person has a loss in their life, the real self will allow the person the necessary emotions, the aliveness of affect, the spontaneity needed of affect to mourn the loss. Right, so when there's a loss, you're in denial, then you're sad, then you're angry, then you compromise, and you go back and forth, and then you forgive, and then you accept, and then you then you defect the life force attachment to that other object, and then you can attach to someone else afterwards. So this aliveness of affect is, is a, an important concept. Because um, if there's a rest of development, you don't have a wide range of affect. The real self offers the person a wide range of affect. Arrested development, if it's in a narcissistic stage in the, before 18 months, the main emotions are hate, greed, envy, schadenfreude, vindictiveness, spite. So they're in battle with the mother and they're using rationalizations and they're lying all the time. There's the false self organization we talked about yesterday. All right, the false self is just a collection of rationalizations. They're always using logical fallacies. And, Every lo there's hundreds of logical fallacies. They're using them all the time. They're trying to lie to themselves, to lie to others, because they can't face the unconscious indifference of the mother. It's too painful. Um, and what they do often is they identify with regrets. They become the mother. So that so the prototype for being able to mourn is differentiate, but they didn't differentiate. They're still fused with the rejecting image of the mother. And they usually um, project both the devalued self and the rejecting mother onto others, and they flip around like that. I mean, so there's a, the narcissistic pattern doesn't have a wide, really a wide range of affect. The narcissistic pattern they don't feel love and gratitude, generally speaking. Now Karen Horn and I would disagree, but generally, just generally speaking, they don't generally feel too much love and gratitude. Their their humor is dark humor, sardonic humor, put down humor, very pessimistic, very cynical. Um, Sarcasm, what is it? Cynicism gratifies infantile megalomania. So there's, that's a narcissist. So when you put someone down in your thoughts or in your words and all that, um, you put yourself up. That's preserving the infantile megalomania and the identification with the aggressor. Because the aggressor, from the baby's point of view, was in a one-up position. The mother was a giantess in the nursery. So we've identified with the giantess in the nursery, and they're putting others down because when they were a baby, the mother put them down. That's how it feels. When the mother's misattuned, the baby feels devalued. They identify with that aggressor and then devalue and objectify others to communicate that when they were a baby, that what they're doing to others now is what happened to them when they were a baby. They're trying to, they're stuck repeating like Sisyphus over and over again, the same thing over, they're acting out constantly. It's continued activity, he said. So when we face the, when we forgive our parents, now we're getting in touch with our sadness. Oh boy, now we're, now, we're, now we're accessing our sadness. Now we're moving towards a wider range of affect. That heals the splits. We get to whole object relations. Now much more of the life force can affect to the self-representation. Okay. That's called ontological security, basic trust, sense of self. With that inner security, then the person has access to the real self. And one of the capacities of the real self is this wide range of affect, appropriate affect, aliveness of affect, spontaneity and creativity is there, and so on. If the person needs to be happy, they can, or if the situation is meant for them to be happy, they can be happy and not feel guilty about it. In the narcissistic pattern, their sense of happiness is what's called pathological joy. It's the schadenfreude. If, if they see something good devalued, they feel gleeful. That's pathological joy. So that... That's not happiness in the way uh, it's normally understood.
But they may say, oh, I'm happy. What they mean is that's schadenfreude. Okay, the next one here. Okay, self-entitlement in a positive sense. From early experiences of mastery, coupled with the parental acknowledgement and support of the emerging self, the developing self, the sense builds up that the self is entitled to appropriate experience of mastery and pleasure. Okay, there's no guilt there, right? It's okay to be happy. It's okay to be successful and express the self as well as the environmental input necessary to achieve these objectives. This sense, of course, is sorely deficient in those with arrested development, okay, with the, with the borderline disorder of the self, or with someone with a narcissistic disorder of the self, or with a schizoid disorder of the self, or any of the, or any of the other disorders of the self. Again, one of the capacities of the real self is that it affords the person a sense of self-entitlement in a healthy way, meaning from early experiences of mastery, okay, the mother supports the child playing with his toys. She's not, she's not afraid that the child becomes himself, coupled with parental acknowledgement and support, so the, the parents are not jealous that the child is more intelligent than the parents. Okay, the sense builds up that the self is entitled to appropriate experience of mastery but that's 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 healthy the child is meant to grow and develop and know himself and he gets support from the environment for that okay in other words he feels that it's okay to be okay in other words okay the next one okay self-activation assertion support the capacity to identify one's unique individual wishes and to use autonomous initiative and assertion to express them in reality and to support and defend them when criticized by others. So if the person as an adult has uh, wants to express themselves and they want to uh, be a poet but their friends are mocking them, they'll say, no, I'm, I'm going to support myself. Jody Mitchell refused all that criticism. They said, no, don't go into jazz. It's going to ruin your career. Well, it's right for me. It's a, it's a, it's a part of my life. I want to explore that area. And that helped her to move on with her life so she defended her uh, herself her interests right um, you know maybe if she didn't go into go into that phase of jazz although it wasn't that successful for her maybe her career would have ended there maybe she needed that you know Acknowledgement of self-activation and maintenance of self-esteem. To identify and acknowledge to oneself that oneself okay, has coped with an affective state and or an environmental issue or interaction in a positive adaptive manner. This acknowledgement is the vehicle for autonomous fueling, for autonomously fueling adequate self-esteem. This is what Masterson means when he talks about this positive feedback loop. He says, uh, one self-help uh, author call, has this slogan, a, a bumper sticker, so whatever happens, I'll handle it. And then you handle a situation that builds your self-esteem. You recognize that you had a difficulty and you handle it and that builds your self-esteem. No, we're not talking about the narcissism. Uh, I, someone criticized me, I put him down, I handled it. I, we're not talking about that realm we're talking about the capacity of the real self okay so he uh, became a painter had some difficulties he didn't know how to build frames but he he learned how to build the frame so now he could frame his paintings he handled it and that built his self-esteem right he learned something new okay uh the next one here is soothing of painful affects okay the capacity autonomously to devise a means to limit minimize and soothe painful affects Okay, so you you can uh, you you have you can do some uh, you, uh, some tai chi or some yoga, and uh, or you can uh, use some meditation. You you can comfort yourself in some ways in a healthy way. Okay, continuity of self, the recognition and acknowledgement through an effective subordinate organization that the I of one experience is continuous over time, and is related to the I of the other experience. So this 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 is. Uh, with a person with a narcissistic pattern, 
they flip around the eyes and they forget it. So um, that's called rewriting history. But with the real self, you're not constantly lying and rewriting history, personal history. You're accepting the history. You're accepting, and it's a part of the continuity of the I. That's what he means. Okay, the ability to have commitments, to commit the self to an objective or to a relationship and to persevere to attain that goal despite obstacles. Okay, so um, in the, with the real self, the person has a goal to... You know, to build his uh, uh, company or whatever, I, whatever it is. Uh, see, the, see, if it's if it's the codependent pattern, they're more impulsive. They want to be rewarded and comforted, and so they're a little more childlike. Uh, and the narcissistic pattern's got to be perfect or nothing. You know, so the real self is a little more realistic, and they can uh, creativity to use the self to change old familiar patterns into new unique. In different patterns, intimacy. See, see, with the with the other ones, with the disorder of the self, to use Masterson's jargon, uh, with the rest of development or in, or an insecure attachment style, they're more rigid about things. They're more fixed about. They're more compulsive and rigid. They're not that flexible. Creativity, you create links and you find new patterns. So your your mind's a little more uh, that way. Okay, is an important one here. Intimacy. The capacity to express the self fully in a close relationship with minimal anxiety about abandonment or engulfment. See, with the disorder of the self, to use Masterson's jargon, um, there's a constant fear that the other person is going to be too engulfing, too impinging, too demanding, or they're going to be too abandoning, because that's, because that's how the baby felt. The mother was too impinging or too engulfing, or the mother was too abandoning and unavailable. So in adult life, they're afraid of close relationships because they're afraid um, of being reminded of what the mother did because they're projecting the loving mother and the frustrating mother onto the partner and, they're, and they have this anxiety. Is this person going to be too demanding or they're going to be too abandoning? So they're not capable of intimacy. So their, their relationships um, tend to be short-lived or uh, they might have... Uh, one author says uh, they tend to... Yeah, in that uh, TV show, uh, The Side Order of Life, there was a woman who had that fear of intimacy. So she had like three or four boyfriends going at the same time. And she wouldn't be close to any one of them, really. She just swapped them around. That allowed her to not be close to any one of them. Right? Uh, or one version of it is you marry someone who has a schizoid pattern. They're not going to be close to you. Something like that. Uh, there are other versions. There are, there are ways to have a relationship where there's a lack of emotional intimacy, but uh, with the real self, you you can you can express your real feelings, and uh, and you're okay. You're you're not overly worried about their response. It'll be disappointing, but you'll handle it. It's not this exaggerated fear that you're abandoning me and you're de demanding so much from me and those kinds of things. Okay, the last one here. Autonomy, the capacity to regulate the affect of the self independently of the object. See, this was interesting because over here, soothing of painful affects, the capacity to devise a means to soothe your feelings. So this means here, that maybe that involves temporarily using some cookies, right? Some comfort food. But you handle it yourself. Here, this focuses on you don't need to use cookies or comfort food. Uh, you can do it, you know, with your thinking, with your mind, uh, with your own presence to yourself, with your own sort of self-care and meditation, that kind of thing. So we covered this uh, as well, the capacities of the real self. I highly recommend Masterson's work. You know, the mentors in this series, um, so we had five, five of the mentors in this series were from Europe, right? So... Melanie Klein's from Austria, uh, Edmund Burglar's from Austria, Margaret Mahler's from Hungary, Karen Horneis from uh, Germany, Fairbairn's from Scotland. Uh, now, the only mentor in this series from Turtle Island slash North America is Masterson. Now, he's the guy that pretty much synthesized all of this information. I, I you know... Uh, hugely underappreciated. Uh, Masterson's 
I highly recommend uh, Masterson's work. It's a great place to start. Um, after reading the Enneagram, okay, you see that gets you started into psychology. Now you want to understand it a little bit more, more technically, let's say. Uh, the good place to start is a book called The Search for the Real Self uh, by James uh, F. Masterson. Um, and he talks about the capacities of the real self in that book. And he summarized object relations theory. He summarized, that's fair bear, he summarized Margaret Mahler, the stages of development to reach the psychological birth. He summarized Melanie Klein's work, splitting defense, projective identification, right? Uh, he includes some references to Karen Horney, keeping the humanism involved. Um, I don't think he mentions Burglar, but uh, Burglar sort of a, he went off on his own. Um, but uh, but it, this series is, uh, the six mentors in this series are Edmund Burglar, James Masterson, William Fairbairn, the three men there, okay, and then um, three ladies, Melanie Klein, Margaret Mahler, and Karen Horney. Karen Horney, she's the one that's, she's the most, she's the one that keeps telling everybody, look, we're people first. And we have these defense mechanisms. All right, so just remember that, we're people first. And we're using these psychological maneuvers to deal with the pain of, 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 uh, of when the mother wasn't available and all that. Oh, okay, uh... So uh, let's go back to the song here. Windmills of the mind. So that's a that's a windmill of the mind. Ten windmills of the mind, right there by Masterson. Okay, we also covered uh, Von Friends is uh, one quote from Von Friends. There isn't too much from Von Friends, but uh, she she offers a lot of interpretations of fairy tales. She's good because Von, Von Franz sort of helped explain about the, the puer, the eternal youth. This is the boy that won't grow up. Right? So that's a form of the arrested development. So one form of the narcissistic pattern is that Peter Pan syndrome. They don't have relationships. The Pierre Gint and the Don Juans, the Playboys, all that. Uh, they don't have... They're, they're caught in... in, in um, in objectifying others, using others. They're greedy, they're, they're selfish, right? So the Peter Pan is self... Well, the Don Juan, the Pierre Gint, they're, they're selfish, they're uh, greedy. They don't really care about others. So, um, so um, there's a very good animation about Pierre Gint, I highly recommend. So Pierre, look, at, look for uh, Pierre Gint, it has English subtitles. It's an animation. I think it's 1979. I think it is. Uh, very good. It's the best. I think it's the best version out there. Um, you can read about Pierre Gint and Karen Horney's work. You can also read about Pierre Gint. There's a very good book by Rollo May called Cry, "The Cry of the Myth." The Cry of Myth. I think he covers Pierre Gint in that one as well. That's a good book, uh, Rollo May. That's his best book, I think, The Cry of Myth. Okay, read a quote here about uh, how when we use defense mechanisms for such a long time, and then we finally get the love we need, we're afraid of it. It's, that's the essence of neurosis. You finally get the love you want, and then you run away from it. But that's what you search for all your life. Yeah, but uh, my whole life has been conditioned around being afraid of love. Now I get love and I'm going to run away from it. So that's, that's, that's neurotic. Right? You want love, you get it, then you run away from it. That's neurotic. Um, the splitting defense, we covered that. Okay. And um, empathy. To stand in another's shoes. I, 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 like, I, I like this because we always say to walk in another's moccasins. Right. Uh, this one says to stand in another's shoes, be present in another person's situation, consider their situation. If you do that without judgment, but understand it, uh, that's empathy. We have that 
a reference to the comedy song by Joni Mitchell. Okay, so I'll just leave it here. So thank you very much. This has been TQ 975 to um, 982. I love more posts to follow. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Bye for now.